Hey everybody. Today we're talking more about hypothesis testing. We're going to get into one and two sided alternative hypotheses. Let's start just by recalling the basic structure of a hypothesis test for the mean. First, we identify a null hypothesis H0. This is a statement about the population mean, and it's typically the thing we want to get evidence against. Next, we identify an alternative hypothesis H sub A. This statement contradicts the null hypothesis, and usually it's the thing we actually want to establish. The idea is that by gathering evidence against the null hypothesis, we're indirectly gathering evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Then we go out and we collect some data and we compute a sample mean x bar. Then we compute the probability p of randomly getting a sample mean at least as extreme as the one we actually got just by random chance, assuming the null hypothesis is true. That value p is called the p-value of the test, and lower values indicate stronger evidence against the null hypothesis, and therefore in favor of the alternative. Frequently, we, can, we conclude our hypothesis test by comparing that p-value to some predetermined cutoff alpha, the so-called significance level of the test. If p is less than that alpha, we reject the null hypothesis H0. By the way, if you're using a significance level alpha, that always needs to be chosen before data is collected. So let's get into the alternative hypothesis in a little bit more depth. On that last slide, I said that the alternative hypothesis was chosen to just to contradict the null hypothesis. But even for a simple null hypothesis, mu equals mu naught, where mu naught is just some um, hypothesized value, there are three possible alternative hypotheses. First, that the population mean mu is less than that hypothesized value. Second, that it's greater. And third, that it's not equal to mu naught. The first two of these are called one-sided alternatives, for obvious reasons. And the third is called the two-sided alternative hypotheses. Each one of these three contradicts the null hypothesis in a slightly different way. The first one, mu less than mu naught, ignores the possibility that mu is larger than the assumed value. We rule it out at the beginning of the test for reasons that have to do with the real world and not just pure mathematics. Secondly, mu greater than mu naught ignores the possibility that mu is smaller than the assumed value. And finally, mu not equal to mu naught makes no assumptions at all about the value mu. When setting up a hypothesis test for the mean, we have to choose between these options based on real world considerations. As a general rule, you should always choose the two sided alternative unless you have a specific real world reason to assume the population mean can't or shouldn't be larger or smaller than the value given by the null hypothesis, mu naught. I think this all gets clearer when we do some examples, so let's jump right in. This first example is taken directly from the, my last video where I introduced hypothesis testing. A candy company claims that the mean weight of its chocolate bars is 350 grams. I worry that it might actually be less. So the null hypothesis is going to be the company's claim. That's the thing that I actually want to get evidence against. In this case, I'm picking a one-sided alternative, mu less than 350 grams. And the reason is that I'm not concerned about the possibility that the mean weight of all their chocolate bars is greater than 350 grams. I don't mind if they're giving their customers too much chocolate. I'm just concerned that they might be shorting us. Example two. A teaching manual claims that a certain exercise takes an average of 30 minutes. So the null hypothesis here is going to be the company's claim, mu equals 30. In this case, I'm going to pick a two-sided alternative mu not equal to 30. In this case, I have no justifiable reason to either rule out or to ignore the possibility that mu is less than 30 or that it's greater than 30. Now you should be careful to remember that hypotheses should always be set at the beginning of a hypothesis test before data is collected. You should never choose or modify your null or alternative hypothesis based on your data. Example three. An oil change business claims that on average, they take 15 minutes to complete an oil change. Uh, maybe I'm a repeat customer and I suspect that it's actually more, that they actually take longer than that on average. 
So the null hypothesis, again, will be the business's claim that their average um, oil change time is 15 minutes. And in this case, I'm going to select an alternative hypothesis that mu is greater than 15 minutes. Again, I'm doing that because I'm only interested in the possibility that their mean time for an oil change is greater than 15 minutes. I'm not concerned about the possibility that it could be less than that 15 minutes. So you may have noticed some ambiguity here. We have some choice. The choice of one versus two-sided alternative frequently depends on the specific research question that we want to address. In this example, I was only concerned about the fact that the oil change business might be taking longer than 15 minutes um, on average. But, there's, but it's easy to imagine situations in which I might just be interested in the question of whether they're accurately estimating their mean waiting time. And I might use a two-sided alternative hypothesis in a situation like that. Now, the, your choice of alternative hypothesis is going to have to affect the way that the p-value is computed. So let's see an example of how this works. A restaurant claims that the mean sodium content of one of its sandwiches is 920 milligrams. A simple random sample of 44 sandwiches has a mean sodium content of 925 grams. At significance level alpha equals 0.01, is there enough evidence to reject the restaurant's claim? Assume the sodium content is normally distributed with mean, I'm sorry, with standard deviation 15 milligrams. In this case, we're going to want to use a two-sided alternative hypothesis. We have no reason to rule out the possibility that the mean sodium content is greater than 920 milligrams or less than 920 milligrams. So here are the hypotheses I'm going to use. So now, as always, we assume the null hypothesis is true. We assume that mu is 920 milligrams. And we compute the probability of randomly getting a sample mean more extreme than the one we got. In this case, x bar equals 925. So by the central limit theorem, we know that the sampling distribution of x bar is normal, um, approximately normal in general, exactly normal in this case since we're sampling from a normal distribution. With mean, mu equals 920 milligrams. We assumed that by the null hypothesis. And standard deviation, sigma divided by the square root of n. So in this case, 15 divided by the square root of 44. Then our sample mean, x bar, has a z-score given by this formula. It's our old friend, x bar minus mu naught over sigma divided by square root of n. Plugging in values and simplifying, we get z equals 2.21. So our sample mean is 2.21 standard deviations above what we would have expected under the null hypothesis assumption. To compute our p-value, we need to find the probability of randomly getting a z-value, at least this extreme, just by chance. In other words, we need to compute the probability that z is greater than 2.21 in absolute value. I think that's clearer when we see a picture. We need to find the probability of randomly getting a z-value bigger than 2.21 or less than negative 2.21. In other words, we need to get that shaded area. The strategy is going to be to get one of the shaded areas and then double it. This is a symmetric picture. So we want to compute the probability that z is less than negative 2.21 in the standard normal distribution. You could do that with a table if you wanted or uh, any sort of technology. I prefer R, and in R the command is p-norm of negative 2.21, and the result is about 0.0136. Doubling that, we can get the total shaded area. It's 0.0271, and that value is not exactly double of the 0.0136, just because of some rounding errors. Since this p-value, 0.027, is greater than the significance level of the test, 0.01, we do not reject the null hypothesis. There's insufficient evidence to support the alternative that the mean sodium content of the restaurant sandwiches is different than 920 milligrams. One important warning here. This is not the same as saying that we have evidence in favor of the null hypothesis mu equals 920 grams, milligrams. Sorry. In fact, our sample data was that the mean the, rather, the sample mean that we got was 925 milligrams, which is obviously not 920. Um, all that we can say here is that our sample data is not different enough from the population mean hypothesized um, to draw any real conclusion. 
also notice that our decision here was strongly dependent on the significance level that we had, that we had selected. If we had specified alpha equals 0.05 instead of alpha equals 0.01, um, we would have rejected the null hypothesis and reached a different conclusion. This fact underscores the importance of reporting your p-value when you do a hypothesis test and not simply um, saying that you've rejected or, or failed to reject the null hypothesis. So let's do a quick summary of how the choice of alternative hypothesis affects the testing process. Of course, as always, you want to determine your null and, and alternative hypotheses at the beginning of a test. Assume the null hypothesis is true and then find the z-score of the sample mean. Now, we have to um, have a parting of the ways depending on, alter all on our alternative hypothesis. To test the one-sided alternative that mu is less than mu naught, we want to compute the probability of randomly getting a z-score less than or equal to the one that we got based on our sample data. Similarly, to test the one-sided alternative that mu is greater than mu naught, we want to compute the probability of randomly getting a z-score greater than or equal to the z-score we got. Finally, to test the two-sided alternative, mu naught equal to mu naught, we compute twice the probability of randomly getting a z-score greater than or equal to the absolute value of z. So in practice, the way that we usually do that is we take the absolute value of z and make it negative, make sure it's negative, find the probability of randomly getting a z-score less than that, and then double that value. And that's what I did in that last example. Finally, if we're using a significance level for our test, we compute that p-value to that alpha, that significance level, and decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis based on that p-value.